William Shakespeare wrote, Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close up the wall with our English dead. In peace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of a tiger. Stiffen the sinews, conjure up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favored rage. <laughs> In other words, it's nice when you don't have to fight. But when the danger comes and the defenses are down and the wall is breached, it's time to go into attack mode. And we will either fix the breach or we're going to die from the lack of willingness to fight. So it's no good declaring peace in a time of war. It's no good being still when it's time to attack. Today, we return to our study of James, and uh, once more, dear friends, we enter the battle for our hearts and our minds that God is calling us to fight. we got to stiffen our sinews. The battle we wage isn't just against physical enemies. It's against the sin in our hearts. It's against the rebellious inclinations that move us away from the truth of the gospel and from the, the real life that we are called to have in Jesus Christ. James says it's our passions that are at war within us. Our problems aren't coming at us. They're coming out of us. That's where our real problems are. And the way we defeat this sinful enemy isn't simply by trying harder to be a better person. If you've ever done that, you know it doesn't work very well. You don't, you don't fight this battle just by trying to be a better person. We can't will ourselves to victory over our sin. The battle is only won by trusting in the one who has gone before us in battle, who has entered the breach before us, who has defeated the enemy of sin for us on our behalf. The victory of the war against sin was won. At the cross, destroyed at the cross. And that victory is provided to us through grace alone, by faith alone, in Jesus who died on the cross. It's that grace that we now apply to the battle against our sin. So the grace that Jesus secured for us and that has given to, been given to us freely is the grace that we use to wage war against our own sin. And that's why repentance and humility and joy, joy in Christ, are the weapons that we use to fight our sin. So we take that truth of the gospel and we bring it to bear on every aspect of our lives. That's how we grow in Christ. And that's how you see victory over the sins that are in your life. You, you, you take this incredible good news, this incredible grace of Jesus, and you keep just applying it to all these different areas. So into the breach with the power of the gospel this morning. And the enemy that we meet there today is a judgmental attitude. A judgmental attitude. Passing judgment. It's basically a national pastime at this point, isn't it? Passing judgment on people. We love to vote on everything. We used to just vote on who the president is going to be. Now we vote on whether or not someone's cat did something cute. We, we, we vote on everything. We click like or a host of different reactions. Frowny face, if you like now, or, 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 or laughing. You, you constantly are voting saying, this is what I think. Everybody must know what I think about everything that's going on in the world. Remember back when you, when you could just like or like, not like something? Do you remember back when you could just do that and nobody knew and nobody cared what you thought? Remember that? Remember that when you just had a, it was just a thought. You just had a thought, and then that was yours. You just kept that. That was you. But now, there's no unexpressed thought. Now, we're all like Caesar. We're all like, I declare this thing good. Right? That's, that's our life. That's our life. We, everybody must know what we think all the time. We love labels. We like, these are bad people. These are good people. He's lazy. She's a hard worker. So we'll take the smallest amount of information 
about somebody, and we'll size that person up like we know everything that we need to know to make a judgment about that person. We, we, we like simple explanations. We like one-to-one correspondence for the things. We like to, to get a tiny bit of information and think we know everything about that. We say, those people are poor because they don't work hard. Th- their kids are acting up because they don't do discipline right in their house. And of course, we ascribe the worst possible motivations to other people for their actions. Someone makes a choice that we don't agree with, and we just assume it's because they're evil or they're ignorant. So what's weird is that in our culture, we also like to judge people for judging other people. This just gets really, really ironic here. If you express an opinion about something that someone else doesn't like, other people blast you for being judgmental. They judge you for being too judgmental about that thing. So this is such a strange world we live in. We've never been more upset at people for being judgmental of each other, but at the same time, we've never been more judgmental of each other. Does it feel like it maybe I'm probably, these are, I'm probably overselling this. This is what it feels like to me. It's what the world feels like to me. Where's all this judgment coming from? Where's the the source of all this? James says that it comes from giving ourselves authority that we don't actually have. That's where it comes from. Judgment comes from giving ourselves authority that we don't actually have. See, it's Jesus who saves and Jesus who condemns. It isn't our job to do either. Our job is actually to point people to Jesus. So if you would open your Bibles with me to James chapter 4. We're going to be in just two verses this morning. James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. We're going to look at these two verses, uh, but they are not the easiest verses to to understand. So what I want to do this morning is I want to just read both verses, the whole passage. It's not very long. And then we're going to get to the heart of the problem here. All right. So James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and one and judge who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you? To judge your neighbor. Now, to make sense of this, this somewhat confusing passage, it's important for us to understand what James is thinking when he tells us not to, quote, speak evil against another person or judge another person. So let's get at this this morning by, by looking at a few things that James is not saying. There's a couple of things here that James is not saying. He is not saying that we should stop using discernment okay he's not saying that we should stop using discernment if your babysitter shows up and smells like weed it is right for you not to go out that evening okay that's an increasingly uh likely scenario here in michigan okay (laughs) that is uh that is okay for you to go ha ha uh, not tonight not gonna happen tonight and you could stay in and never go out ever again if you don't want to Using judgment is required to make good decisions. We know this. You need to use discernment. Sometimes that requires making judgments about other people so that we make good choices. So James is not saying that we shouldn't use judgment. Psalm 1, for instance, is very clear on this. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. You can't not walk in the counsel of the wicked if you can't identify wicked counsel. Okay? So you have to make discerning judgments. That's the first thing it's not. Also, he's not saying that we should not point out the sins of other people. Now, this is where well-meaning Christians often get in trouble. Okay, So this is a little little bit harder here. This is where we tend to wander off the path and we get ourselves in trouble. But follow me on this. There's a difference between guiding someone in righteousness and standing over them in judgment. Okay? There's a fine distinction. You need, this, this difference is key to the passage. 
There's a difference between guiding somebody in righteousness and standing over them in judgment. James, after all, is the guy who spends much of this letter calling out and correcting the sins of the church, including these verses. Including these verses, he's calling out sin. A good example of this is back in chapter 2, verse 5, when James tells the church, Listen, my beloved brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. James is saying, you did this. Church, you're doing this. So that sin needs to be discussed. It needs to be part of the conversation. The church needs to feel the weight of their sin so that they can make the right choices. They can make the right corrections and change course. Jesus is pretty famous for saying, Judge not that you be not judged. I'm sure we all know this. It's quoted to us all the time, right? Judge not that you be not judged. Aha! See, Jesus is even saying that judging people for their, for their sin is sin itself. And yes, it is. Sometimes. But here's how Jesus ends that teaching. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Don't miss this ending to what Jesus is talking about when he talks about judgment. Critical judgment without a proper view of your own sin is hypocritical. It is wrong. It is a huge problem. There is no doubt that there is a lot of this sort of judgment that's even happening in the church today, and it needs to be discussed. But one of the reasons to see our own sins clearly is so that we can take uh, lovingly removing the speck that is in our brother's eye. One of the reasons that God gives you the ability to see your own sin is so that you can see and help your other brother who's also struggling. And that means helping our fellow Christians recognize the sin that is in their lives and that that they're not seeing. And so we have to discuss sin. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to have somebody talk to you like this, but that's what we're supposed to be doing for each other. And finally, he's not saying that we shouldn't use hard language that helps people see the truth. Hard, truthful language shakes us out of our delusional thinking. I don't know about you, but when someone speaks to me softly or sort of gets a, skirts the issue and that sort of thing, I tend to not really put a lot of weight into what they're saying. But that's not how the Bible speaks at all. The Bible speaks using some very harsh terms sometimes. When we're tempted to make excuses for our sin, we need to hear someone tell us that we are adulterers against the Lord, which is exactly what James does here at the beginning of this chapter, earlier in chapter 4. In chapter 2, he said that we are fools if we think that we can have some kind of belief that saves us, that, where that belief doesn't show up in the way that we act, that our lives don't match up to what we say we believe. If you can't see that faith is real and active in your life, you are a fool, James says. A little spoiler alert here. Uh, In a few weeks, James is going to tell us that those of us who oppress the poor should weep and howl for the miseries that will come upon us. Oh, that's going to be a fun week. I can't wait for that week. Right? Weep and howl for the miseries that have come upon you. So what's clear is that James is not opposed to clear communication of very harsh realities. He's, He's willing to say hard things. He doesn't treat sin lightly. He doesn't shy away from pointing to the condemnation that comes from treating sin lightly. And neither should we. So, if he's not telling us to stop using discernment, to stop pointing out sin, or to stop using hard language, what is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about the kind of judgment that accompanies speaking evil against each other. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of judgment that's it's critical. It's an evil judgment that works against the love that we're supposed to have for each other. For just a moment, I want you to consider that last word of the passage today. Neighbor. We hear that a lot in scriptures. Does that, that sound familiar to you? Jesus uses this word 
to describe the sort of love that God commands us to have. Love your Lord, you love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what? Love your neighbor as yourself. So both James and Jesus are simply drawing attention to what the Lord has already asked people to do in his law. This, this should be really very clear, James is saying. By using this word, he's saying it's very, it should be very clear to you as a church. In Leviticus 19, which we heard read earlier, we have this great description of what it means to love our neighbors. And when you read that passage, you, you get the sense that this is the passage that James had in mind. Here's a, here's a portion of it. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So that word there, slanderer, has the same idea as speaking evil in James. So the law says that we're supposed to be righteous in our judgments and we're not to slander other people because that's how we show love to our neighbor. And that, by doing that, it reflects the characteristic of the love of God. And to double down on this, he says, I am the Lord. You see how he... With with that, I am the Lord, he's saying, this is true, you must be this way because of who I am, because of my my character. The, The judgment James is talking about is an ungenerous, ungracious, unrighteous, judgmental attitude that's actually very closely related to slander. So when you when you slander people, you try to make them look bad. That's what slander is. You are trying to make somebody else look bad. When you you make evil judgment, you are assessing and condemning that other person. So here's the difference. You'll see how closely these are related. Slander is telling your friends, you know what? I can't work with Carl. He can't do anything right. That's slander. Evil judgment is I can't work with Carl because he can't do anything right because he's just a spoiled rich kid that didn't have to work a day in his life to get the job the way I had to. That's evil judgment. See how they're related? One is showing how someone's bad. The other is showing the the reasoning behind why this person should be condemned. There's incredible similarity there. And James is talking about that hard-hearted, ungracious stance that we take toward people when we disapprove of something. So we then trust our judgment way more than we should. This is the problem. We think our view is correct. We think we see clearly. Our sinful hearts are inclined to take certain facts about people, come up with the worst possible conclusions, label people, and then hold them accountable to the judgments we have made. That's evil judgment. And when we do this, We are actually taking the place of the law. James says that when we slander and judge another person, we are actually slandering and judging the law. Now that sounds a little strange to us. What does he mean? This is is the part of the passage that's a little bit confusing to us because we don't usually think like this. Think of it like this. Jesus said that the whole law could be summarized By loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. You could take God's whole law and you could summarize it by by the principle of loving people. And we saw that in Leviticus. That's written right into the law. Love is a command. It is not an option. It is not a suggestion. Love is the command for God's people. But when we decide to judge other people without knowing all of the facts without caring enough to thoughtfully get to the bottom of a situation and make our righteous, loving, discerning conclusion, what we are actually saying is that our loveless law, our way of doing things, is superior to God's loving law. That's what we're actually saying. So we are declaring ourselves in that evil judgment, we are declaring ourselves to be the authoritative law. So here's the irony of this. A lot of people pass judgment on others thinking that they are somehow defending God's law when in reality doing that very thing is breaking God's loving law. 
Thomas Jefferson famously took out his pen knife and went through his Bible and cut out all the parts of it that he didn't particularly like so that he came up with his own version of cut and pasted scripture. He took out the miracles, he took out the resurrection, he left in all the moral teachings of Jesus that he thought were good and reasonable. Now, I would guess that a lot of us in this room would see a problem with that method. That wouldn't be proper exegesis for those of us in the know on those words, right? That would not be the way you would maybe approach scripture to get the best out of it, to really understand it. Who's the authority at that point if you do it? Is it God or Thomas Jefferson? Right? But let me tell you, church, we exercise that same method every time we choose to harshly judge and criticize another person based on our version of God's law while cutting out the part of God's law that tells us to discern with love and charity and righteousness. We're basically coming up with our own law. When we do that, we aren't upholding the law ourselves. We become lawbreakers. We go against the law of Christ when we judge in this way. Our harsh judgment makes us a violator of Christ. We are as much in need of repentance as the person that we think needs to repent if we judge people in this way. So let me ask you, do you have someone in your life that you consistently judge? Is there somebody in your life who who you just is always the recipient of your judgment, maybe a friend or a family member, ask yourself, have I demonstrated the charitable love of God in a way that I have spoken to this person about these issues? The fact is we often negatively judge other, uh, the motives of others, but we rarely judge our own motives of judgment. That sounded a little confusing. Let me try to say it again. We often look through another person's actions and say, oh, they're doing this because of this. This is what's motivating them. They're, 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 they're angry because they're jealous. We, we are good at seeing through another person's motives behind what they're doing and casting judgment on it. But rarely do we turn that same scrutiny on ourselves and say, why am I such a judgmental person? What is my problem? What's going on inside of me? What is the motive behind my desire to condemn others? See here, Kyle's law makes me feel morally superior to other people who never measure up. When Kyle's law is in play, other people just do not measure up to me. But God's law assures me that I am a lawbreaker in need of grace. I am a recipient of grace I do not deserve. Kyle's law doesn't care about the struggles that factored into a person's bad decision. I don't care. You did the wrong thing. I judge you for it. But God's law considers every aspect of my brokenness and applies the proper amount of his grace to me. Kyle's law wants others to permanently feel the weight of their shame over the thing that they've done. You should never get over this. This should scar you for life how you've done these wrong things. But God's law consistently focuses my eyes on the cross where my shame was removed so that I could be set free from the bondage of my sin. Kyle's law ends with condemnation, but God's law offers me and everyone else unfathomable grace. So who am I? Who am I? Who is Kyle that anyone should care what his law says? Who are you to hold anyone in the grip of your judgment? And it gets worse than this. You thought, can it get worse than this? Yes, it can. It gets worse than this. James says our judgment of the law is actually worse than we think because it's actually an attempt to take the place of God. If we condemn people based on our own amended law, what we're really doing is we are inserting ourselves into God's place. We become the judge. Now, this is one of those moments in the Bible where the Bible explains our behavior in a way that we probably wouldn't. I I probably, at at no point, if you came to me and I was in my sin and I was doing the wrong thing and I was judging in this way, if you came to me and asked me, At no place would I say, oh, I'm trying to be God now. 
I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't phrase it like that. Uh, but if I critically condemn my neighbor in a way that shows no love for my neighbor, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to take God's place. And there's only one person who can save, and there's only one person who can destroy. That's what James says. If God desired to show no grace, which is perfectly within his right to do so, he would destroy everyone for their sinful rebellion against him. He would just destroy us all. Without the cross, there would be no substitute sacrifice for our sins. We would be the sacrifice for our sins. But God's will was to show mercy and to gather his people into one community saved by the one sacrifice of Jesus. So we don't contribute to our own salvation. We don't offer anything to God. Even our gift, or even our faith is a gift given to us. We are merely recipients of a grace that we don't deserve. And because of that, we have the Holy Spirit whose, whose power guides us and convicts us and turns our hearts to Christ and encourages us in, in the in eternal life that we get to have for no good reason at all other than the fact that God chose to give it to us by his goodwill. So God did all of the creating, all of the condemning, God did all of the work on the cross, God did all of the saving and transforming, and ultimately God will bring the final judgment against sin. So, who are we? Who are we? That's the question he asks. Who are we? But who are you to judge your neighbor? You ever hear that? Who are you to tell me what to do? You ever heard that before? It's actually a better question than we think. It's a pretty good question. Because the biblical answer to that, when it comes to final condemnation, is I'm no one. I'm merely a recipient of God's mercy in Jesus Christ. Who are we to act as if our virtuous life is some product of our goodness? that we have some moral high ground, that somehow we make godly decisions because we are such good people. We're not good people. We didn't start off as great people who figured it all out and now you need to follow me and understand me and know what I think in order to have a great life. No, we're horrible, rebellious, insensitive, intolerant, unloving lawbreakers whom God has chosen to save for his own glory. That's who we are. That's our identity. And we get to bask in that incredible mercy. And we get to see the fruit of the Spirit working in us, renewing us, making us whole again, giving us eyes to see what we couldn't see before. When there was nothing but deadness there before, God has made us alive so that we can help ourselves and help our families and help our church and help others see the glory of Jesus Christ. The same deadness that we often find in ourselves is what we are often judging in other people. Who are we to assume that we could possibly do anything but point people to Jesus and his incredible grace and that incredible good news we're not God. When we critically judge other people, we violate the very law that we claim to uphold, and we take the place of God. We take the place that we, of the God that we claim to serve. And so we need to take the right place. That's what we need to do, church. We need to take the right place. Oh, there's so much room for Christians to help other people see the, 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 the specks in their eyes. Oh, there's so many places where we can help one another, build one another up, and sharpen one another. I'm so thankful for the people in my life who have come alongside of me and said hard things so that I could, I could follow Jesus more closely. I'm so thankful for that. But we need to take the right place. Because we're sinners saved by grace. We have the unique opportunity to help other people see their way to that grace. That is going to require talking about sin. It's going to re require talking about God's law. But not from some kind of moral high ground. We come at it from the standpoint of one who has violated that law and has been forgiven in Christ. You, you can't stop with the law and claim that you are sharing the gospel with another person. Oftentimes in our judgment, in our judgmental attitude toward other people, we will condemn, but we don't share grace. We'll say this is wrong. You shouldn't do that. You can't live that way. But we fail to come through and say, 
I, this is how to live. This is where life is found. It's in Jesus. It's not in me. It's in the grace of Christ. So your wayward son or your hard-hearted boss or your failing husband or your bitter wife is not going to change because you condemned their sin. That will not change them. In fact, what it'll do is harden them. It'll harden them. Their hearts are only going to change the same way yours did, by the saving power of Jesus. We need to embrace what the church has often called charitable judgment. Uh, Jonathan Edwards described charitable judgment like this. He said, it's a disposition to think the best of others that a case will allow. I love that. It's a a disposition, it's an attitude, to think the best of others that a case will allow. Ken Sand um, describes charitable judgment like this. He says, out of love for God, you strive to believe the best about others until you have the facts to prove otherwise. So the disposition, the, 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 the perspective is, I'm going to try to think the very best about what's going on here until I know for sure that there's reason for me to have concerns. And even when we get those facts, and even when hard things must be said, there is always love and charity and humility that is guiding other people to that truth. We want to see them know Jesus. We don't want someone to just change their behavior We want their behavior, their attitude, to drive them to the solution that is Christ. That's what we're called to do. Can you imagine if the impact on families and on our church and on our community, if our first reaction to every piece of negative news and to every potentially negative situation was to withhold judgment? Can you imagine that? To admit that we don't have all the facts and then to extend Christ-like grace? I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you to remember your standing as a sinner saved by grace. You're not the law maker. You're the law breaker that Jesus loved anyway, that poured out his grace on you. I want you to remember that your heart's sinful inclination is to see the worst in people. This is really hard for us, but the fact is, in a non-transformed heart, you're always inclined to see the worst in people. In a person that's been saved and transformed by Jesus... We want to see people like Christ, and yet, in this world of struggle, one of the things that the Spirit is overcoming in us is this natural inclination to see people in the worst possible light. We are not hardwired to be gracious. God's grace makes us gracious as we grow to be like him. So circumstances where we could become judgmental are actually opportunities to grow in Christ-like love. When that, think about that next time you feel judgmental towards someone. This is my opportunity to be more like Jesus. And finally, I want to encourage you to ask some questions when you feel the urge to convict and to condemn. Am I concerned about God's law or am I concerned about my law? It's a great question to ask yourself. Whenever you're feeling angry, whenever you're feeling motivated to condemn, maybe to slander, ask yourself, am I concerned about the glory of Christ or am I concerned about the law of me? It's a great question. Do I want to see God honored or do I just want to be right? Hmm. Because if I just want to be right, it's probably because I've got a law that I've set up myself that everybody else needs to follow. Does another person's sin cause me to repent of my own sin or to revel in my moral superiority? When you see the brokenness and the sin of the world around you, does it cause you to become a repentant person? person that follows hard after Christ, or do you see yourself as better than others? And finally, the question, how can I most helpfully guide people to Jesus? If you see someone struggling, making terrible choices, ask yourself, Jesus, or ask Jesus, what would you have me do to help them see you? Burdens all made.